Hey, everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage. We're back for another edition of the Thyroid Answers Podcast, and we have a guest once again. Today's guest is a medical physician, a board-certified plastic surgeon. He's been doing this for 26 years, but he specializes in breast implant removal surgery and breast implant illness. So I thought this would be a great topic. I've had a number of clients who have had um, challenges with breast implants, had uh, had them removed. Um, we're going to have a conversation with him, see what we can glean and learn from him with all his vast experience. So uh, Dr. Whitfield, welcome to the Thyroid Answers Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. Sure. So your plastic surgeon, typically when we think of a plastic surgeon, we think of them putting in breast implants and doing breast augmentation. But how did you get into this process of breast implant illness and taking breast implants out? Sure. Um, well, I trained in surgery uh, for six years, a plastic surgery for two years and a year of a fellowship just working on oncologic reconstruction. So my initial career started at an academic university where I taught uh, microsurgery and I performed head and neck cancer reconstruction, breast reconstruction, sarcoma reconstruction, lower extremity reconstruction for trauma. So it was a heavy dose of reconstructive surgery and and to a degree and, in, and certainly i was brought there to teach aesthetic surgery as well we did a small uh, number of those cases you can tell from what i just said my days were kind of long and i didn't have a lot of um, opportunities outside of where we were using the implants and breast reconstruction uh, to utilize that but we did augmentation the the natural progression was over over year after year of doing cases to correct implant problems and breast reconstruction, either through capture contracture, uh, radiation injuries, malpositions, scarring problems, painful implants. Those patients have a lot more surgery. So I got really adept about taking care of implant-related issues in that patient population, which then translated to me taking care of problems in the cosmetic population. So... I didn't principally do what you would consider a primary augmentation at a young person or later on in life uh, after having children, people would do a rejuvenation uh, where they did a tummy tuck and a breast augmentation with or without a lift and a uh, rejuvenation for a mom. I mostly took care of complex breast problems related to scarring, malposition, cancer-related issues. And then a cancer patient in 2016 re relocated to Austin from uh, Georgia. And she came to me because she wanted to have her breast reconstruction taken down. And um, it wasn't a very common request uh, in my career, but definitely a handful of times I uh, made patients flat, which is becoming more common now. And uh, the way I would do this because of the way of my training in oncology and reconstructive surgery was basically to take all the material out intact and then always send that to be examined to make sure there's no recurrent disease, no evidence of recurrent cancer. And then, of course, if an implant is involved in any kind of reconstructive technique, we'd always culture the field, which means take a what you would consider like a Q-tip swab, wipe it, and then uh, put it in a, a tube with medium and send it to the lab so they could culture it uh, or put it on an agri-plate and then incubate it. So those were the standards, you know, I was taught and I executed those uh, for this patient. And she, you know, actually had no physical findings on examination. She, as many, many patients have who went through chemotherapy and or radiation therapy, have fatigue. That's just a very common complaint. And uh, she had that and no other issues. And uh, at a week, I saw her after surgery. Her surgery went really well. And uh, her pathology was completely negative, which is the most important thing in a cancer case. You want to make sure they don't have any recurrent disease. And so that was fine. And then I reviewed her culture results and she had an E. coli infection. And hmm. so uh, so for everybody listening, it's kind of hard to fathom that someone of my level of experience would miss an E. coli infection on a breast implant, especially given we had laboratory analysis and diagnostic studies and physical examinations with no findings. So, you know, why did this happen or why was this going on? And so for everybody listening, 
if you lock in a small amount of biofilm or bacterial contamination around a device, it's very hard for your body to clear it. And infections or biofilm formation around a device happens because it's contaminated by the staff giving it to the surgeon prior to implantation or by the surgeon contaminated upon implantation. Or the third, which is the far, by far the most common, is, is a bloodborne infection. So you get a skin cut, it gets infected, or you get a uh, you uh, you know upper respiratory tract infection, urinary tract infection, GI problem, uh, just anything the air infection, right? You you can you you kind of put the bacteria into your bloodstream, and because this is an implant, and it could be a hip implant, knee implant, breast implant, cardiac implant, dental, whatever. I've taken care of all the problems of everybody who operates. And that's how they attach the surfaces. And your body can't really get rid of them because the implant's not alive. So then it creates a complex interaction where chronic inflammation develops. And in this case, um, this was far more than just biofilm. Biofilm is usually less than 10 to the 6 uh, for a documented infection in a standard laboratory anal uh, analysis at a hospital. It's greater than 10 to the 6 bacteria, typically per hyperfield. And so I was kind of baffled by this. So he's just walking around with an E. coli infection and I get her sensitivity pattern back. So uh, for the audience, when you culture some uh, wound or, or, or a space and they incubate it, they'll give you a sensitivity report so you can give someone a, a appropriate antibiotic therapy. And so I did that for her. And what do you know? All of her fatigue went away. So she actually had an underlying infection that was giving her chronic fatigue. So is so the this mm -hmm. term breast implant illness is this is this the kind of the standard thing we'd see is some type of immune or inflammatory or symptomatic response that's secondary to something like an infection developing around the implant So uh, the story gets a little bit more complicated so she put me on a message board on social media and all of a sudden I had people start coming to me requesting explants. The office is getting calls and they're like, why do these people call you wanting their implants removed? So I started doing these cases and you can obviously follow the thought process. If I missed one infection, I was not gonna miss another infection. So if someone mm -hmm. came to me and the request was to remove them, be it for capture contracture or what have you, you know, I, I would accommodate the request if it made sense, you know, on their, uh, examined with them and um fast forward i believe it was 2018 I've, i had done you know quite a few at that point and i had an icu nurse travel from uh, louisiana her sister lived here in austin she wanted to be taken care of here she wanted to stay with her sister and i did her case and she had the slimiest implant when i got it out and examined it after the fact that I had ever dealt with. And I was like, well, this has got to be a biofilm or an infection or, you know, something's got to be on this because it's not normal. And so I sent the swabs as usual. And at a week, um, I'm sorry, I, I went out and told her husband, I was like, you know, this is clearly contaminated. I, I don't know with what. And, you know, I, I feel like if we just get her, you know, um, at that point I use drains, if we just get her taken care of and follow up with her, cultures that will get her take care of and at a week her culture showed no evidence of bacteria and so for everybody listening it's very hard to culture bacteria that are locked in biofilm because it creates this kind of sugary uh, coat around them so they're not easy to both be dealt with by your body and they're very difficult sometimes to culture so just real quick explain for the listeners what biofilm is in relation to to the organism yeah, so the, the organism itself produces this filmy coat that's like a goo around it. So it protects it from being attacked by your immune system. So your cells, once they realize there's something foreign, they try to get it out. And if it's an infection, um, yeah, they're, you're obviously trying to rid it. So in my way of thinking about this, this is really a chronic inflammatory process, the, the device is a component. And in my greater than uh, 900 some samples, um, about 30% have biofilm. Now I switched from regular swabs based on that case to PCR testing of all my samples. So from 
February of 2019 until now, I've I've got the largest single series of PCR tested samples for breast implant illness in the world. So just for the listener, kind of explain the difference there for the swab. Essentially, you're kind of culturing a plate in the PCR. What's different about that? Right. We learned in the pandemic that the antigen test versus the PCR test, like what's the difference? The PCR test is always the more sensitive test. So this one's looking at DNA fragments of 150 different types of bacteria, fungus, mycobacteria. So the level of sensitivity and specificity goes way, way up relative to doing a culture swab, which may have a small number or the most common listed based on that hospital. Like they'll have a, a normal uh, number, but this, um, you know, like, like anything, I was really frustrated because, you know, first time I missed an infection this time, I didn't know what was going on, even though I knew it was wrong. So I, I called and made an arrangement with a lab here in Texas to get all of my samples sent and examined through PCR analysis. So every single patient of mine gets the capsulectomy, uh, you know, we're trying to take it out intact, uh, because I've had a case of cancer, breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma in the first 500, and about 30% of the samples have biofilm. So we're trying to do our best always to get things out intact, not contaminate the fields. Um, and we feel like, you know, that's the best uh, option in these cases. So where did, who came up with this term, breast implant illness? It was a term to describe, you know, what they're going through, and it doesn't have an ICD or an international classification of disease uh, code because it's not, it's not a a disease. So, basically, the way I think about it is like any chronic inflammatory process. So everybody has a certain amount of genetic ability to manage and detoxify their body. So there's certain pathways in the body. In particular, the vitamin D synthesis pathway, the actual antioxidant pathways, the if you want to use glutathione as an example, the glutathione pathway of the liver, and then the uh, methylation pathways. A lot of people have heard of MTHFR. They may not, you know, know much about what that means, but they may know they don't methylate well, so they may have more problems clearing inflammation. So when those things um, are, we'll say, reached capacity from how much inflammation you face, either from not just a device, but the environment you live in, you know, the air you breathe is is not as good as it was uh, 10 years ago. The water you're drinking may be contaminated. The uh, products you use may have parabens in them. They may have uh, somebody who drinks a lot of plastic, uh, out a lot of plastic water bottles will have phthalates. The food may be contaminated with glyphosate, which is common crop desiccant. So there's all sorts of things that contribute to inflammation. Um, people have heavy metal exposures and other things like mold exposures. So that's a pretty common problem, honestly, in Texas is mold. Okay. So if, 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 is this generally in the rest of the plastic medical community is this idea that, hey, these breast implants can be triggering chronic illness? Is this a, is a general consideration? Uh, or is this really a concept that's, that's kind of getting there? Or, I mean, like, would most plastic surgeons go, yeah, that's a possibility? Or would most people say, nah, I don't think this is, there are the breast implants are really creating a lot of disorder or disease or oh. symptoms? Nineteen at the breast implant hearings held in Bethesda, I testified about this, and we gave, uh, from a society perspective, multiple, you know, uh, testimonials were given about this, and this is not a new problem, and um, it's only becoming uh, more apparent, and you know, through you know, functional genomics and toxicity testing, gut health testing food sensitivity testing and hormone evaluation, you'll see these things. And and obviously the thyroid is your specialty. And so I see people who have been told they have Hashimoto's and all these different things all the time. And many times I feel like the thyroid is acutely sensitive to inflammation. So if you have problems with inflammation, it seems like it goes off earlier to me than anything else. Sex hormones seem to kind of come at the end, typically. And, but the thyroid seems to be affected very early on with this. 
So I have many, many young people in their 20s who've been placed on Synthroid, which is kind of an odd thing to me. And when I do their explants and their inflammation drops, the bioavailability of that drug goes up and they go and become hyperthyroid. Oh, I wouldn't doubt that at all. I mean, it's the premise of my whole book is that the thyroid physiology isn't typically the problem, it's an adaptive response. So if we look at from a cell perspective, you know, cells operate in one of two modes. They're either in like manufacturing, low stress, homeostatic manufacturing mode. They're making stuff, bringing glucose in, making protein, peptides, all kinds of great stuff. Or they're in cell defense, as if we think about two primary, you know, simplistic yeah. roles of the cell. And when cells perceive excessive stress, danger, uh, they activate that cell danger response. And every aspect of the Every step of the cell danger response is either directly or indirectly influenced by the amount of thyroid hormone in the cell. Um, and so I think what we often see in people who have hypothyroid symptoms, even when their TSH is still within a reference range, um, is the cellular hypothyroidism secondary to a cell stress response, hypoxia, organisms, toxins, whatever. And it's adaptive response. We think it's broken, but it's probably adaptive. Because even if you think about what's happening within the cell, if you maintain the high state of uh, thyroid hormone status, then you're going to continue the manufacturing process. You're going to make more peptides that could support an organism. You're going to bring more glucose and nutrients into the cell that could support the organism. And you're going to increase mitochondrial function, which might induce too much oxidative stress and create tissue damage. So I think the, the, the tissue hypothyroidism is the first thing that probably occurs in most situations. And then as there's more inflammatory tissue damage, PAMPs and DAMPs released into the system, those PAMPs and DAMPs, my, based on where, what I've read and, and my thought process is those, those circulating DAMPs and PAMPs are probably the initiators of the thyroiditis. It's not an immune system out of control, but an activation of pattern recognition receptors that induces the thyroid cells to then essentially self-destruct and release in signaling molecules, which then attracts the lymphocytes into the thyroid gland and there's more damage. And I think it's a better way to kind of think about what's going on with thyroid physiology in our clients, because we tell too many people that they have you know, their immune systems out of control, which is then you're screwed if that's what your belief is. But when people like me or you reduce the stressors that drive this immune inflammatory, this kind of cell danger and defense response, not only do we see people convert T4 to T3 better at a cellular level and signs and symptoms improve, but we see less thyroiditis and we see a gland that can start to recover. And many of these patients that were put on thyroid medication need less and less, and mo many of them none. There is a recent paper I just read the other day that said that maybe 90% of the patients put on thyroid medication are done so inappropriately. It's crazy. Wow. That was from a meta-analysis from 2008 to 2018, but that's a crazy statistic if it's accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I I feel like we see it routinely, you know, uh, you know the the level of, and there's no great, as you know, I, I was working with a startup about a test for chronic inflammation that was measuring a urine metabolite because there's no clear, sensitive, and specific technique to measure inflammation in the host, and then I need a KPI to follow. I need something to follow over time as it decreases, and right. I use all this of my own, you know, wherewithal to get this done, but it's not specific enough. It's easily manipulated by diet or ingestion of an inset or or something. So <clears throat> although you can start with extremely high amounts of inflammation and then through a, a preoperative approach we use for my recovery program, start to lower it pre-op until you address the, you know, in this case, the a big, large foreign body that's creating this immune response, it's very difficult for them to, from a cellular standpoint, recover and then reset and then get better. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think managing to try and manage, if you know what the, if you have a good idea that, hey, I've got this toxic thing <laughs> that's triggering the immune inflammatory response, man, trying to manage the immune system and the inflammatory system makes sense, but ultimately... Um, there's no way the person is probably going to be, uh, have normal in this situation, normal thyroid physiology. They may not have normal gut physiology or anything else. 
if they have this chronic immune inflammatory response because they're operating potentially from an allostatic state. So fight or flight mechanisms upregulated, parasympathetic heal, repair, regenerate, systems downregulated. Sometimes we assume that everybody's going to, if we give them a specific supplement, that it's going to work the way we want it to. But many times it doesn't because it's not the state the cell and tissues are in. But yeah. Let's get back to the breast stuff and we'll continue the conversation. But I just want to talk from, from a breast implant standpoint. Um, what is it? And I, what is it about the breast implants themselves? Is it just that they're getting contaminated? Or is there something about the, the breast implants themselves that are potentially toxic? Do they release toxins into the system? Uh, they, I think we already said that they, they can be a site that organisms are attracted to, but is there multiple things that make them problematic? Well, I mean, no foreign body's inert. Your body reacts to it as soon as it's placed. It tries to wall it off and get rid of it. So from that standpoint, I mean, I've done reconstructive cases with, you know, allografts, which are cadaver bones for patients who had cancer and, and big, huge metal implants. And then, of course, breast implants for cancer. And um, we've put these big plates on jaws after we can reconstruct them with uh, your, your fibula bone. So all of these things could get either contaminated or infected or reactive because your body doesn't recognize it as like. So of course it's a big reaction. So how that works in every person is, you know, I always say you can't pick your parents and that you cannot run a bad diet. So all those things play huge roles in, you know, how you're from your gut health, you know, to your hormonal balance, um, your level of toxicity, your ability to detox that based on your genetics. I think co collectively, that's how I look at it. It's not just one thing that's it's rolling because I have a lot of patients um, who had uh, implants paste uh, for cancer or what have you that will not have trouble. They will not go through the process because, you know, genetically they probably have two or three or all their pathways work well. And then, you know, conversely, other aspects of their lifestyle, their diet or their fluid or air quality is high enough until something happens, some trigger happens, you know, maybe you get a stressful life event, a death in the family, a childbirth can happen. I've seen people develop problems after pregnancies, uh, whether they're complicated or uncomplicated. Um, so the, there's always a lot going on. It's, you know, a device is a device and I've used them to correct and, and save people's limbs and, and obviously do breast reconstruction and make it so you could eat food again. So it's not like every, you're never going to get rid of implants. So th they serve a role. It's just, um, you know, I think the breast implants that are textured obviously create more inflammatory response. And many of them around the world have been pulled completely off the market for that. And I've dealt with them and, that makes sense to me because if for the audience listening, if a, a device is smooth, there's far less contact to your tissues. But if the device is textured, meaning think of like the 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 mountains in the Rockies or the Sierras, there's all this contact, there's all this increased surface area for your body to interact with. And so instead of it being the size of a sheet of paper unfolded, it's like four sheets of paper unfolded. And that's greater... Um, interaction with your body and your immune system response to that and it drives a T cell response. And that's how people, you know, in our, in our understanding, we think that that's how it drives a lymphoma to develop. Is there, so I, I think one of the things that you pointed out, which I think is important, and I think it goes to a lot of things, it tends to be not necessarily an individual process, but how well people adapt to different stressors depends on the load that they're already carrying. So if they already have a stress from a, an unhealthy diet, dysbiosis in their bowel, poor sleep habits, poor breathing habits, poor physical fitness, emotional stress, trauma, limbic windup, that's a person who's probably maybe more susceptible to having an implant 
potentially create issues than somebody who's in a higher state of overall health and well-being. Sure, of course. And I, I think we're on the same page and like that for us makes a lot of sense. But in, in the general understanding, like most people don't understand the difference between clean fruit, dirty fruit, and how it gets into your system and affects you. So somebody who has a high glyphosate count on a tox test is going to have an impaired endocrine response, which is what's leading to much of what you're describing. So mm -hmm. all the people sit before me and they almost can't sit still. They complain of pain. And, you know, when I get someone like that, I think they're immediately all the time in fight or flight. They're just in stress response. And those are the people I just put in my hyperbaric oxygen chamber complimentary and let them have some oxygen and try to get them to, in, for lack of a better term, relax because they're hypoxic. Yes. And the more hypoxic you are at any level, the more pain you have, the more drivers you have of the stress response. And then, you know, so in my program, so everybody listening understands when I do surgery, the day after surgery, you come to my office and you get in my hyperbaric chamber, you know, our lymphatic massage device. We don't use drain tubes because they're a bit antiquated and they don't cause anything, you know, other than you know, problems downstream the longer you leave them in because they're foreign bodies, you can get infections and things like that. So I've had about, uh, I think, one infection in four years and I don't use drains anymore. So we rely on your, your the most exquisite filtration system in the world, which is your lymphatic system, to then get it to your kidneys and get it out of your system. So we have a lot of touch points in the office, but I believe a lot in hyperbaric oxygen therapy, lymphatic massage, uh, we have red light therapy. We support people with really, really high protein diets and um, easily absorbable amino acids. We have a great restaurant in Austin you can come to called The Well. No seed oils, gluten-free, dairy-free. So all my patients go there and have dinner. Like, you know, for us, it starts with what you put in your mouth, whether it's food, water, and the air you breathe. So uh, I think- So I want to get- I want to get into all that stuff, uh, but let me get a couple more things in and then we'll get into the- Pre, strip, pre, maybe pre breast removal strategy during the during the treatment and post treatment. Um, is there for somebody who's got breast implants and has chronic health issues? How, how would they know that maybe the breast implants are a contributing factor? What signs? What symptoms would they could they consider to say, hey, maybe I maybe these things are are an issue and a problem. You know, because somebody might say, well, I don't have any pain around there. Well, you know, how do I know if it's an issue? This is a big deal to put them in. It may be a big deal to take them out as well. Uh, sure. And a lot of times people put them in because it's for aesthetic value, right? So what what signs and symptoms should they be looking for to lead them to the fact that, hey, maybe this is an issue and I need to see somebody? So the standard for us is basically you can check every box almost on a review of systems either two or three per system. So from head to toe, the neurologic system, you know, I have a lot of patients with neural inflammation. They'll have sound sensitivity and light sensitivity and headache. Um, and, you know, something like in the ear, nose and throat realm, you'll have dry eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, may have problems with just swallowing. Many people that diagnosed with eosinophilic esophagitis um, they'll have from a respiratory standpoint, a lot of difficulty, not just having devices in place, which can contribute to tightness of the chest and heaviness of the chest, but they'll feel like they have shortness of breath. I have people have constant problems, as you would imagine. And somebody who's really in a stressed out flight or fight, fight or flight state, a lot of heart racing. A lot of people feel like they're having palpitations all the time. In the peripheral nervous system, people will get all sorts of strange symptoms like shocking pain, uh, extreme nerve pain, uh, burning, vibration type symptoms. And then the entire, you know, musculoskeletal system, you can get anything from myalgias or just muscle pain to joint pain to both migratory things. People have been told they have, you know, rheumatoid or because they'll have an elevated, you know, uh, uh, yeah. RA count, which is pretty nonspecific as we know. R A and A. And then the um they may have intractable UTIs, bacterial vaginosis, uh, every kind of gut problem known to man, um, swelling, bloating, constipation, diarrhea, uh, just 
chronic abdominal type symptoms. And, and they'll be like, nobody understands when I tell them this, what I mean by this. But if you just think of that, that is a chronic inflammatory process that's affecting kind of every body system. Yeah. And that's how it's like, it sounds like every patient I see. So how do we, how do you go about, cause I would look at that and see the same thing. It's more, I call it a multi-system adaptive disorder. Like every system's impacted. And I would expect it if there's some type of chronic stress or chronic inflammatory response, but is there something that you might see or look at in an individual and say, it could be a gut issue. It could be something this, it could be that could be the breasts. How do you make the determination like the breast implant is more likely the problem versus some of these other things? Do you, is it because somebody's been to and other functional medicine practitioners and VIs and they've done a whole bunch of things and nothing's worked? Or is there some other specific blood marker or uh, symptom that really differentiates just this person with a chronic inflammatory disorder from maybe a host of issues versus this is this is a person who's probably the breast implants. Yeah, you know, my my typical kind of scenario is they've went to everybody. Mm -hmm. They've tried acupuncturists, um, other holistic practitioners, functional medicine. They've tried traditional medicine. They've been to all the fancy clinics that we know about around the country. Mm -hmm. And mm, they have reams of paperwork. Mm -hmm. um, no real answers. So instead of them presenting to you with that process, the difference is they show up to me and they have longstanding breast implants in place. So to me, it's a very selective group that now is just focused on removing whatever, you know, some of them already have had all their amalgams removed, anything, you know, IUDs, anything that could be foreign that's contributing to immune response, they've been counseled to get those out. And they've done that. Mm -hmm. They'll all have people, this is the last box to check if you will yeah mm -hmm. now that it's becoming more and more understood people are coming to me as the first box to check right and i have to figure out you know listen to them and understand that, you know i don't offer everybody surgery that the, not everybody should have surgery honestly they're not prepared to do it anyway so it's a more uh specific kind of complaint coming now and i think the the kind of awareness is certainly much higher and it's much more consideration and then a lot of times i just have people come and tell me like i'm not symptomatic but i want these things out now i'm going to try to get pregnant or i want to live i'm living a different lifestyle now mm -hmm. so that those are very commonly you know heard in my in my clinic now Okay. And I think I get the gist from what you talked to earlier that it's not just, hey, let's lay them down, let's pull these things out and zip you up and then we'll call it a day. There's some things that you're thinking about overall from the health of the person uh, that we need to consider, other factors that may make it more make it more problematic for this person to get healthy and to get well. So it sounds like you have a functional medicine approach from a to get these people to be in a better state to heal and to repair um, as part of your process. So are there pre breast removal strategies or things that you want like all of your patients to start from a, from like, Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do this procedure. We're going to talk about diet. We're going to talk about lifestyle first before we even get into the process. Like how do, what are the pre removal strategies that you, that should really be, um, taken and then maybe the host implant removal processes or strategies that need to be kind of considered so that people have the best outcomes. And I think you kind of talk about your, your heart program, which is probably what I'm referring to. Yeah. We want to be really strategic when we use our, our recovery program. So a lot of people come from around the country and now out of Europe to visit me to have simultaneous explant lifts with or without uh, fat transfers. And they, they want me to do it and they want to run our program. So our program is set up to look at genetics, toxicity, gut health, any kind of food sensitivities, and then where are their hormones at. 
if I'm doing any of these cases to get somebody to recover properly in the most efficient way, you know, we have to give them nutritional counseling and we support them with things preoperatively like more digestive enzymes as I increase the protein in their diet because many people just don't have enough proteases at our age, if you want to think of it like that in our 50s, to handle what I'm asking them to do, which is increase from maybe, you know, 0.7 grams to a, a gram or a gram and a half per kilogram of body weight. So I have people routinely who are very small on 150 grams of protein a day, and they'll be like, how am I supposed to do this? So we'll we'll give them a powder that's just broken down amino acids. And they'll utilize that in their, you know, shake or their water or what have you. But really, it's fundamentally identifying all those other drivers of inflammation that we can address, get them pre-op. Uh, we partner with CellCore for detox pre-op. We have a psychologist who works with groups to help get them in the proper mindset. And we have a health coach for support as well. We have a functional practitioner on staff over labs because I've obviously uh, at this point in my practice, I can't from a time perspective do that anymore, but I used to do it all the time. And then we will set them up for surgery. So our surgeries are trying to get as, as specific as possible to help the patients. So in our testing, we have pharmacodynamic genetic testing so we can better understand how they're going to respond to uh, narcotics around the time of surgery, or we use gabapentin a lot to help reduce nerve pain pre-op. And we use celecoxib, which is a COX-2 inhibitor. We want to reduce inflammation. This is an ERAS published uh, protocol for plastic surgery. It starts the night before, not the morning of. So we're trying to obviously decrease people who are going to have bad post-op nausea vomiting. And we try to head that off in the beginning. And then intraoperatively, when I'm doing cases, if I'm doing fat, I have, you know, tremendous amount of investment in equipment. I've done thousands of fat transfers. Um, we have uh, a process that's very quality driven and the same, you know, for each patient. So the, the patients change, but the process is really the same for the patient. So they're getting quality that way. And then when we take an explant out, um, as soon as we get all the capsule material out with the device, we put it on the back table, we send off our PCR test sample. And then I anesthetize the chest wall and the abdomen. And we do that with long acting liposomal pupivacaine. So patients have, when they wake up, not sharp pain or, or sensations. Um, and then they'll have about five to seven days of pain relief from that. So that we get the chest and the other areas under control with that. And then we use eyes and anti-inflammatories. And then the next day they come to the office for hyperbaric oxygen. They're a big believer in terms of reducing oxygen deficit to drive or, you know, a diminished pain response, if you want to think of it like that. So my patients don't require additional narcotics. Usually after the first one to two weeks, they don't get additional pain scripts and um, they don't want to take it anyway. And we yes. switch a um, telecoxib to resveratrol because um, people want to take a homeopathic, you know, anti-inflammatory. We make sure that they stay on point with their diet. I see them. Uh, at a week, a month, three, six, nine, 12 months. And then my practice has um, detox, you know, running in parallel uh, to the surgical follow up, which that's ran by the detox program and the practitioners in that with CellCore based on their preoperative testing. So that we're trying to do the best over that period of time to really reduce their inflammation and, and help detox, you know, what they may have. Do you find that most of the clients that are coming to see you, that they're making so, some of these diet lifestyle changes fairly easily? Or do you find that some of these changes that you're asking to do are, are quite a bit of a struggle for some? I think the majority of the people who come to see me or seek me out now are very health conscious and it's not as hard to discuss being gluten-free and dairy-free and, and avoiding seed oils and eating enough protein and, and really being careful. But I think when I show them a tox test and they have a lot of glyphosates or they have BPAs or something on their tox test um, or mold, you know, I'm like, okay, most common places to get mold your house. And I have a lot of people from the North and I have a lot of people from the South 
And so there's humidity. And then when you go up north, it's super cold and there's moisture inside the house because they're locked in and it's, you know, minus 11 outside. So there's lots of ways that our environment impacts us. So I just counsel them on increasing air quality with higher filtration down to 0 0.003 microns to get spores out of the air. And, you know, many of them are already very sensitive about water quality. So they're being very careful with that. But food is still a problem. The quality of the food is a problem depending on where you are and how you access it. As we know, a lot of the fruits obviously are very dirty with glyphosates from just the crops and how they're treated. So that's still a problem that I see routinely. Um, products have a lot of parabens in them. So women have to be very careful about the products they're using and, and maybe just check with the envir environmental working group online, your products and make sure that you're doing the best to take care of and protect yourself uh, from, from ingesting those things through your skin, basically. So are you, you're educating them on these, how the toxins in, the, in our environment, organisms are driving potential issues with the breast implant and or that these exposures are the things that create the cell stress response, drive the inflammatory response and create a whole host of issues, including thyroid issues, blood glucose regulations, it rates, blood glucose regulation issues, et cetera. Yeah, I think I just treat them globally. I think everything is contributing. And, and when you address that, then these these folks who've suffered a long time with chronic inflammation can get better, as you know. So mm -hmm. if you don't, they won't. So if people think you can come to me and just have an explant, you're magically going to get better. That's not the case. Yeah, I think people, I'm sure a lot of people would like if that was the case. Hey, just pop it out and life will be good. So for the person who's getting an explant, I think you were kind of referring to or discussing this a little bit, but you know, somebody's getting maybe they had this in for aesthetic values. Are, are you taking them out and they're back to flat, or are you using tissue, fat tissue, or something to rebuild the tissue at the same time? That's a great question. I've done thousands of fat transfers beginning in my career uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, helping cancer patients mostly with breast cancer and, and getting better. Uh, aesthetic results because they have the most complicated aesthetic results. And then we translate that, of course, to if someone doesn't want implants and chooses to have a fat transfer, it's in our practice commonplace to go ahead and uh, retrieve the fat. And we have a specialized Wells Johnson fat transfer system to collect, store, and the process and reinstitute or, or uh, transfer the fat back into the spaces we want. So the fat belongs in the space between the skin and the breast. That's the fatty compartment. So just beneath the skin, but above the breast tissue. We don't want fat in the breast because that can cause cyst formation or radiographic abnormalities. We don't want fat, if I'm taking an implant out, in the old implant pocket because that's really not the environment we want to place the fat in for it to heal. It needs some kind of construct blood supply to heal. So... When I discuss this, okay, the difference between having an implant for cosmetics is the implant exists, basically provides pressure and pushes the, the muscle, the breast tissue forward. So if you're flat to begin with, then you have this volume created by the pressure of the device. As soon as you say deflate a saline implant, it immediately goes back to what it was before. Provide the same quality is, is good enough. So in large saline implants, I always recommend deflation. And I'm not worried about anything else because I know that's going to be an easier operation for the patient because it's a much smaller device. Think of like, you know, a disc versus a big beach ball. So anytime you increase the volume, you can, in my mind, in my experience, diminish basically how much surgery I'm having to do, stretching and tugging and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's easier. If it's a silicone device that's pre-filled, obviously I just have to take that out intact because I can't do anything about it. So those go from 100 miles an hour to zero all at one time. So those patients, and if there are small patients, petite, thin um, envelopes of skin and, and breast, they obviously got that for a reason because they didn't have much tissue and they may have been, I've heard stories, people get bullied in school uh, for being small breasted, they always worried about it. They felt ashamed of it. There's all sorts of reasons for this. And it's not for me to judge why they did something or, you know, it, it's just to provide the best kind of results we can get for them um, 
And I do a lot of uh, low body weight, low BMI fat transfers, which is kind of harder to do, but because I did them for all sorts of cancer patients over time, it's, I mean, for me, it's not a, a big issue. I have the instrumentation, the experience to do that and providing them um, more volume to help uh, cover the surfaces, pr help prevent maybe some adhesion formation, give more volume back to the best of our abilities. Certainly um, in the, in in most of our clients' minds, whether we're traveling so far to come see me and get it done. And so there's there, is there any, and I would think the same things would apply. You want this person to be in the best state of health so that the fat transfer, um, if they rebuild this breast tissue has the best chance to be successful. Um, so I think that you would, Another great reason to have these people following healthy diet, healthy lifestyle, reducing their toxicity would be beneficial. Is there, is there any, does the fat, tran when you transfer the fat there, does it become, does it stay stable? Does it degrade over time? Uh, does, it, does it need to be re redone at all? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. There was a lot of research done on this in the kind of early, mid, into the, kind of late 2009, 10, 11. And for primary augmentation, when you take somebody who's nulliparous, no kids, probably tight skin envelope, even with a device to help expand the skin and placing fat, pretty high volumes of fat, sometimes four or 500 cc's of fat per side, they would have only about a 50% take on MRI study at one year. So... Mm -hmm. So how do we adjust for that in these more complicated patients or breast cancer patients? So we reduce the amount of volume of transfer. That's one aspect of it. And then the skin envelopes, as we age, get looser, not tighter. So it becomes a much easier thing to place in the, the space or the compartment that contains the fat. And then, you know, it's, it's more about the things we discussed already, the lifestyle issues of diet, and hormonal balance and obviously getting into a parasympathetic state, not, not the sympathetic state. So, you know, stem cell activation in my head has to function in order for this whole process to work. So we take and run them through the program to really decrease those drivers of inflammation so that we feel the body is going to take and, and really do the job of healing the fat transfer. So, it's very challenging in some of our cases, but um, we feel we have the best situation to to help get those results for those patients. So if somebody is considering, hey, I'm small chested, I really want to, for whatever reason they want to, or considering breast implants or breast augmentation, what are the key, is there or any breast implants that you would recommend? Would you? How, what would be the recommendation? Uh, you know, obviously, there's a lot to discuss there. But is there any that are you would recommend, or what it would be the best strategy for somebody who this is a thing that's really important to them? Um, so they, you know, just, you know the flat chest that they just want to have some, so they feel more confident about themselves. You know, before maybe everybody was just throwing in a a saline Im implant, and hey, now I've got this done, but given in, in light of what we're talking about, what's the safest strategies? Right. So I actually had a med student, you know, come to me with the same question recently. And so she uh, had done her due diligence about implant related augmentation and then using her own fat. And um, she was convinced and she wanted to use her own fat. Obviously this is going to be a reason this is a case where the reasons will line up, right? This is a young person. They've always had small breasts. They've not had children. Their skin envelope, their skin is tight. So this is exactly what I was talking about. Like, how do you get this person the result that they want? So when I speak to that client, we'll just take this example of a fat transfer. So I tell them it's definitely more than one procedure for you to get more than a cup to a cup and a half size based on your tight skin and your small body, your small frame, your lack of body fat. Because as we get older, we usually gain fat, we don't lose it. These days, everybody's taking GL1P inhibitors, so yeah, you lose fat a lot more when you're older. But, so if I'm having the conversation 
with the, the patient and they are opposed to just a cup size change or more than one procedure, then they're automatically falling into the implant category because the only way to achieve the result they want, and they may have an image in mind already. And once they've got that image in their mind, it's really not my job to change it. It's my job to make people understand and inform them properly of the risks and benefits of having a device. And I've always felt very strongly that it's very hard when you're 18 to understand the risks and benefits of a medical device. I think, you know, for me personally, they ask, uh, I get asked all the time, you know, people won't put me on the spot. Would I let my daughter get breast implants or would I let my wife get breast implants? Well, first of all, neither of you, neither you or I can tell anybody what to do. All you can do is lay out the facts. Mm -hmm. This is the experience. This is what I know. And I know their genetics and I know their diets and I know their toxicity burden. So I'm a little bit ahead of the game in terms of that. And so my, my daughter's a Leo. I don't think you can tell a Leo what to do because you can't tell me I'm a Leo. You can't tell me what to do. So mm -hmm. I would just explain the information and people have to arrive at their decision. That's called shared decision-making like that's. Mm -hmm. a, so I'm not ever going to stop anybody from getting the implant because mm -hmm. they've already decided that. I'm not going to put an implant in because I stopped putting them in about four years ago. I got tired of taking care of the problems associated with the complex issues I was dealing with. And I just decided to do uh, removals and holistic transformations with fat. Um, I'm kind of an older guy now. I'm 54. I've done, you know, been operating since 1996. I like to narrow down what I do and concentrate on those. Uh, I feel like that's the best situation for myself and my clinic and my team. Awesome. So if we, we've kind of covered, we've kind of walked through this whole breast illness thing. We've talked about what, what might be creating challenges and problems. We've talked about pulling them out, some of the strategies that you use in your clinic post-operatively to help. But with the, we've got some time left. So from a general health perspective, um, maybe your, your staff does this, but there is, we've got a lot of food religions out there and we're talking about diet. Where do you stand on, from a dietary standpoint, what's your general guidance to your, your clients about what might be considered a healthy or optimal diet for somebody, whether they're recovering from the, from breast explant surgery and, and, or just general health. Yeah. I mean, we're not omnivores. So basically, you know, I want people to have higher protein diets. There'll be very strict people about being vegetarian or being vegan. Those are my hardest clients to take care of because it's really complicated for them to get enough protein into their diets. So we use a lot of pea protein. We use the amino acids I talked about, but they have the most complicated recoveries they typically will stay a little swollen a little bit longer. And it's not that they're not trying to lead a healthy lifestyle. It's just, just by nature, I feel like they're all a bit under in terms of, you know, the protein demands I put on someone to heal and recover after a procedure. And this is not a small procedure if we're doing more than an explant. And even if you're doing an explant, it still is a stressor on the system. So if, if you have somebody whose system has been chronically inflamed and then you meet me, the master of acute inflammation through surgery, now you have two things happening. You have acute inflammation on top of chronic inflammation. And so if you're not doing things to eliminate the chronic inflammation drivers, and I drive a big chunk of acute inflammation to do, and you get a big cortisol response, which is part of the stress response after surgery, all your hormones are activated, your thirst centers are activated, you're drinking water all the time, and you swell up like a balloon. So I tell all my patients, like, all right, here's the hack. So each time you want to, and I'll tell the caregivers who are with them, like each time you want to drink a big glass of water because your body's thirst center is turned on after surgery because of the stress response, just put some aminos in it or make a shake with it or make a smoothie or, or do something so that you get more nutritional value in it. Because as you increase the protein in your in your system, you're, you increase what's called oncotic pressure in your in your uh uh, vascular system or your blood vessels. And that's what draws the fluid out from the tissues in conjunction with our aggressive lymphatic massage technique. So you can hear where I'm going with everything we're doing. We're very like protocol driven and trying to get your body 
to do its job. And your body has the best set of systems ever. You just have to support them properly and let them do their jobs. And would you say that the, the role of the protein and essentially the amino acids that come from the protein we eat are essentially the building block for the tissues, right. the enzymes, and everything we need to be functioning? Most people, I agree, most people don't realize that they, they're not getting enough protein into in their diet. And, um, and when they really sit down and take a look at what they're consuming from a macro standpoint, most of them are pretty high carb moderate fat and, and many times low protein. And I would say probably the vegetarians, the vegans tend to be, I think, you know, we do spend a lot of time talking of, you know, arguing with amongst the, the whole food community, like which whole food diet is better. Um, but I think for the general population, I think most of what they should be focused on is just eating whole food as a, as a general rule, making sure they're getting appropriate amount of uh, proteins for sure. Um, and then, and healthy forms of carbs and fat before they start worrying about, should I be carnivore, paleo, ve vegan, vegetarian? How about we just eat more whole food based foods and less yeah. toxic foods, I right? Care. I don't care what diet you run. That's not my problem. My problem is getting enough protein and amino acids into the system to kick you into positive nitrogen balance. So you recover like that's the hack. So, right. And I've probably forgot more about taking care of sick malnourished patients than most people will ever understand and those are the fundamentals that help you heal and recovery. So if I can take somebody with a near completely, totally burned body and keep them alive with nutrition, feeding their guts, and um, you know, take them through the what is a very difficult process of removal of dead tissue and skin grafting, et cetera, those people would all pass if you didn't give them enough protein and give them a competent skin envelope. But it's the way you feed them that allows them to survive. That's it. Right. And do you, and I'm sure your team talks to them about the carbohydrate intake and the sugars and all the processed food and the detrimental effects that those foods can have on the healing process. Yeah. So that's a given. I, when I chat with folks, I'm, I'm just pretty blunt about this. Like you, if you're going to work with myself and my team, you're going to go on a gluten-free dairy-free diet. You're going to eliminate seed oils. You're not going to have processed foods. You're not going to have refined sugars. You're going to eat from basically what you're describing, whole foods, real food, not out of a box. And that's the way they'll meet. Many of them were like, Oh my God, I started eating that way and I feel so much better. Well, yeah. I mean, that's, it's not that it's not a complicated formula. It's just, you have to be willing to, or even curious enough to listen to me to get better. Yeah. Well, everybody has their five secrets, right? That they talk about this time of year to fix your chronic illness or chronic condition. But I, I tell people all the time, there's no real secrets here. You got to eat healthy, whole food. You got to get appropriate amount of sleep. You got to keep your emotional stress uh, low. You got to work on your emotional fitness. You got to exercise. I mean, there's just foundational and foundational, foundational principles that if you want to be healthy, you've you've got to engage. You got to have these healthy habits, or you're not going to be healthy. And there isn't a magic supplement or drug that's going to fix you. I'm glad you brought that up. So, just for everybody listening, if you're going to come to Austin and get a fat transfer, here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen to what we said about diet and really take it hard. Get you know an app, My Fitness Pal, counts macros. Really learn what you're doing and be diligent about it. And if you're exercising at extremely high rates, thinking that's the way to go is do high amounts of cardio, you're not going to be a client of mine because you're going to be really too lean. So I prefer people to exercise in a manner with, and this may sound a little bit ludicrous, but I want you to actually concentrate on lifting weights. You're not going to bulk up. It's nearly impossible for you to do this. But when you stress the system, you know, we become sarcopenic, we start losing muscle mass in our 30s. So it's important to drive protein in our diets, have good fats, good carbs. And when you exercise, I'm not a fan of hit or of uh, spin or of, you know, extreme amounts of running, because those are the people who come to me and say, I need a fat transfer. Well, you know, how am I supposed to do that? You're not really going to have an adaptive 
what are you going to do to adapt to what I need you to do? Because when you get done and you revert back to what you normally do, you're going to burn it all because that's just not, it's not conducive to me helping you maintain a result because it, it demands that you modify your diet, modify your lifestyle, modify your exer exercise pattern and take care of yourself with su proper supplementation and rest. I mean, it's, it's all, the sauce is not very complicated. There are, right. as you said, secrets to it. Yeah, no secret. It's, it's foundational things. Unfortunately, everywhere we have a tendency to look for the the magic that I can keep my cert my my current diet lifestyle, and you can give me a bottle of something and it'll fix it. That it just it just doesn't happen that way. So I we'll finish up here with a couple questions. Obviously, you're in Austin and and you work from there. And I'm guessing you said people fly in from all over the place to um, work with you. But if somebody was going to consider a breast explant and they're and they they can't get to Austin and they're looking for somebody local is there is there is there a group an organization uh that follows similar strategies as you do for breast explant like is there you know can they go to a, a website say hey here's a whole bunch of doctors that 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 think just like Dr. Whitfield uh, or have been trained along the same way, or is this a unique thing to you and your clinic? So as it stands right now, it's unique to us. So my strategic holistic accelerated recovery program book is coming out this quarter. Um, we have a training program for both practitioners and surgeons, and you can work remotely with our detox program. So I think we have a lot of, people to serve. So I used to just try to serve our, our clients and really what I need to do now, and we're hiring more surgeons to help offload my schedule, which is really serve a much larger group. So people who just like you're asking, like, where do they go to get the information? They're just, they just want to learn. They can go to my podcast, breast implant illness and, and, and follow the show and learn all about it. They can, mm -hmm your show and other appearances I've done. They can get our book when it's out. But I want to help practitioners of all levels of, of training and, and background get better at recognizing, understanding, and helping these clients, really, because they, they don't know what to do. And, you know, a lot of them have been not, they haven't been treated very well. They've been told they're a little... Uh, out of touch with reality. They've been placed on medicines for depression and not the right thing to do. So I'm happy to help educate and inform others and, and teach them. So whether it's a patient, I'm sorry, a, a, a doctor who's just focused on thyroid like yourself, or if it's somebody who has a functional practice, there's an acupuncturist, a, a medical doctor is transitioning or, or wants to learn more. And an endocrinologist hit me up the other day from, um, Utah about, you know, my, my process and wanted to talk to me about it. So I feel like people are interested and want to learn more. And our, our next level will be to provide more education. And almost like you say, uh, uh, uh you know, it'll be on our sites. It'll be Dr. Rob's training.com. But so those things will help, you know, get us to the next level. So more, there's more clarity and understanding about breast implant illness and, and how we feel our best practices for it. Yeah. Cause that's often, the question somebody says, well, hey, you know, I get the same question. So who, do you, who's you, who have you trained or where do I go to find other practitioners that are doing what you're doing? And it's like, I, I don't know who's doing what I'm doing, but that's something to think about. So the same idea. So is I was, I didn't know if there was already established something where somebody could go, okay, here's the certification program that anybody's that I've walked through or trained has already gone through and then you can look for that certification, but that's not quite there yet. This is still a, a process that's unique to what you do in your clinic. It sounds, you sound very much like what we would call a functional practitioner with these ideas and these concepts. It's not necessarily what we, the way, the way a, a allopathic practitioner is often trained. So at what point did you, was it, were you always maybe more functionally based or was there a point where you said, man, there's this diet, this whole diet lifestyle thing. 
really is an important thing to address. I think it goes back to how I was trained. I was trained by very, um, just a super talented group of surgeons. They've all passed away now, but they were very um, rooted in uh, just nutrition was the foundation of surgical care and it still is. So every surgeon gets taught nutrition and it's not that we don't know it. I don't know how carefully we think about it in the day-to-day -day of taking care of patients like I do. I've always been very curious about and interested in genetics from college. And as the genome project happened and more testing became available from 23andMe to Nutrigenomics to the DNA company to Envision Labs that I use, it's just gotten better and better and better and, and more interesting to me. So I think the important thing for anybody listening is you got to remain curious about what you're doing and you know i've <laughs> i work a lot of hours but it's not really work because it's mm -hmm. i have a great team i have a ton of great patients and uh that's you know kept me interested i honestly when i went to private practice solo i office with a functional medicine practitioner and um, just learned a ton from them and functional nutritionist. So I think, you know, uh, it's the way things should be. They don't have to be, there doesn't need to be division amongst anybody. It's just better understanding will help the patients. So, well, I, I think that's great. I, it, when, when I was writing my book, The Thyroid Debacle, with my friend, Dr. Kelly Halderman, you know, I've initially both of us had come from medical training and come from medical fields. And, um, and we each had our own individual reasons for getting into me into chiropractic care and then into functional medicine and her into um, into naturopathic medicine and functional medicine. But um, I think sometimes, you know, we hear a lot of anger sometimes in the functional medicine community kind of directed at the allopathic community, me, me included. And at some point, as we were writing the book, somebody said to me, this sounds angry. And I'm like, you know what, probably it's the wrong tone. And, you know, Medical physicians are do they have a they have a job they have a, a training and they're doing one effect, one a process, um, but from a functional medicine standpoint, we've got a kind of a different job. And what we need to do is not be adversarial. I agree. I think what we need to do is continue to build the bridge to say, hey, this is this is really what you do. Do this crisis care. Do the do the surgical these treatments that that can really change lives in one way. And here we are from a functional medicine standpoint, we can work with these patients for their diet, their lifestyle, and from a, a nutritional standpoint uh, to make other changes. And if we can both, if we can all work together, we can have the best uh, for the patients overall. The person who just wants a, a medical out treatment process, and if that's all they want to do. They don't want to change their diet and lifestyle. Fantastic. Here's the, here's the road for that. If the person who doesn't want a lot of those interventions, here's a strategy to, to maintain uh, maybe a healthier state through diet, lifestyle, nutrition. And for the person who wants a combination of both, hey, we've got practitioners that uh, have built the bridge and work together to give the best for the patient and the, so they can have the best outcome. So I think that's the, the long-term uh, goal should be for us to all be working together for the best of the patient versus maybe having an adversarial relationships. Yeah, I don't. I have folks all the time, you know, that help us out from all the levels of, of training and background and you know they're super talented people like I, it, it's just it's not it doesn't help the patients all i would ask that all the practitioners listening is like please on your intakes intakes add you know if you're taking care of patients do you have implants and you should take an inventory whether it's an iud a door plant a breast implant a hip implant a knee implant a dental implant it doesn't really matter you need to be understanding that any of these things can be contributing in a small or large part to the problems you're all taking care of. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, let's finish up with what's you have a book coming out. What's the name of the book? I think we're just going to name it the strategic holistic accelerated recovery program because my program has been running and I'm getting more and more strategic about how I deploy it who I deploy it with, who I'll work with. I think for me at this point, 
I want patients and practitioners are really committed to getting people better. So those are the patients I want to take care of and the practitioners I want to help. So that's our strategic holistic accelerated recovery program that everybody is going to be able to take advantage of is coming out this year uh, in Q1. Okay. And then if people want to find out more about you and your, and your processes and procedures, where, where would they go? So you can follow us at Breast Implant Illness Expert on Instagram. I have a show, Breast Implant Illness, that's on Spotify and Apple, and then drrobertwhitfield.com and breastimplantillnessexpert.com. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you joining us on the podcast and uh, and sharing your wisdom. Um, I will we'll be sure to add the the links that you provided and uh, have a have a fantastic night for the listeners. There's a lot of important information that's uh, shared in this uh, discussion, even though it's a, we, it'll be kind of titled about breast implant illness. Keep in mind what Dr. Whitfield said is any implant in the system could potentially be uh, a source of, ish, of potential problem. So this is something you can share these ideas and these concepts with anybody that you don't have to have a breast implants, they could have any type of implant that could potentially uh, be a source of potential problems. So please share it with friends and family. All right, Dr. Whitfield, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. And uh, we'll look forward to maybe talking to you sometime in the future. Maybe when the book comes out, we'll, we'll have you back and talk about what the book's about. That'd be great. I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much.